Hi, I'm Chase McPherson, writer of the Bloodbound series. You can learn more about the books at bloodboundnovels.com or reach out to me on social media at by Chase McP. You are watching and listening to Two Geeks Talking. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video gaming industries. And I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. We are joined today by a very talented individual. He's, of course, the author of the Bloodbound series. Uh, this is a novel series. We're joined by the ever-talented Chase McPherson. How are you doing today? Doing great. Woke up first thing in the morning just for this. I'm excited. <laughs> well, that's good to hear. Author, novelist, all-around amazing person, very talented individual. For those that don't know anything about yourself as a creative person, tell us who you are and what you're bringing to Two Geeks Talking. That will be virtually everybody. I'm not insulted by the concept of people not knowing me. I barely know myself. By day, I work in journalism. I work at a TV station in North Alabama. By night and by weekend, I write even more than I do in my day job, but I delve into fantasy realms. My current work is called Bloodbound. It is actually a reboot of something I tried writing about 10 years ago. I self-published three novels in the series before kind of petering out and hitting a wall creatively. And so I just abandoned the project, sat on it for 10 years, always wondering in the back of my mind, what would I do if I started fresh? And this past summer, I figured, you know, everybody else is rebooting their stuff, so why not me? I rebooted this series. It's the same basic concept, but I changed various plot points, got rid of some characters, got rid of some scenes that really didn't work after 10 years of rereading my work. Between August and November of this year, I have written three brand new novels under the same banner of Bloodbound. It's the same characters and format, just I think much better and more interesting for readers to get involved in. Could you share the inception of Bloodbound, the series itself, and its evolution over the years? Bloodbound, I conceived as a blend of a LGBT friendly, it's a male male romance set among vampires who work in an underground justice organization. We're blending a bunch of genres. I've decided to call it genre fluid because each book has different concepts intertwining. You've got corporate espionage in the first book that turns midway into body horror. Then the second one expands on the body horror aspect and introduces the concept of alternate dimensions. And that leads into the third book. So I'm finding that as I'm writing this, I'm finding interesting concepts and genres to, to move into. So no one book is ever going to be in one encapsulating genre. I started writing Bloodbound back in 2010. This was during the height of the Twilight phase and the True Blood phase. Yeah. I was a huge fan of True Blood, not so much Twilight. And being a gay man, I was like, this is great and all, but there's not really much that speaks to me and my community, not considering myself a, an advocate for gay writing or anything. I just wanted to write something that entertained me and I, I could easily put myself in as a reader. I like to say that when I read a book, if I can't put myself in the picture as one of the characters, I'm not going to be a fan of the book. So I wanted something that anybody could really insert themselves in, imagine themselves as the character. And from that, Bloodbound became my passion project. The wonders of, of being a creative writer and a creative person like you are here, reinventing a series that didn't age well, possibly, when it came to a, a, ten, a decade of, of sitting. I, I think that's uh, wonderful to see that you're able to reimagine your characters and at least find a, a, a series that you've created and a world that you've created and made it your own and, and made it unique and different, which is great to see. The fusion of vampires and espionage in Bloodbound is distinctive. Can you explain the decision behind this amalgamation and its impact on the series uniqueness. The organization, which is 
it's called the order. Um, it's not very distinctive and that's by design. Um, the concept is that they are stopping other nefarious organizations. The one main one is called the crown. And we get more into that organization as the series goes on. The concept is that the order is stopping much bigger things from happening in our real world. Like there's world wars and stuff going on right now. There's terrorism going on, but this organization is stopping even worse things from happening. One thing that was in the back of my mind as I was writing this is to avoid tropes and cliches. I didn't want my vampires to just be brooding loners who did nothing but feed on people. I wanted them to have a purpose. I wanted them to have convictions. And I thought, well, putting them in an office environment was pretty base level. I actually have not decided whether vampires are known to the general populace in my world. So to keep them in an underground organization like the Order seemed the logical thing to do, where the people who work with them obviously know their existence, they're okay with their existence, but whether or not they're known to the general world is a matter that's up for later discussion, later exploration. How does being a journalist in real life affect your creativity when it comes to writing your series? As a journalist, one of your, one of your first tenets is that you don't make stuff up. Uh, you have to report what is going on. You have to be very even-handed. And I talk like I'm, you know, working for a major network or anything. I, I don't. I work for a, a local TV station. Nothing major happens every day, but you still have to put those rules in mind when you write every story. And then when I come down to my home computer on the weekends or at night, I can just kind of let loose. And it's it's a very cathartic outlet to just kind of go into the darkest depths of my mind and cause trouble for other people, fictional people. Yeah. Yes. You have three novels. What are their names? And who is the main character that we're following throughout the series? Bloodbound Reawakening is the first one. I called it Reawakening because it was the reboot of the story. It also hints at my main character, whose name is Hunter. He starts the series as a human. He will, by the end of the first novel, become a vampire. Like me, back when I wrote the original series, was fighting depression, thoughts of self-harm. We don't really explore that to begin with. When we start the novel, he is at a nightclub gay bar in Dallas. And he inadvertently interrupts a mission from the order. His bartender is actually the lead investigator for the organization. Through their meeting, they develop a bond. It very quickly develops into a romance. And because he interrupted the organization, he had to be let in on what the mission was. And he gets recruited basically as a new agent for the order. As I said, he does become a vampire when the mission that he is in gets botched and he very nearly loses his life. The second half of the novel is basically him coming to terms with learning how to be a vampire and this secret agent type investigator. Um, and then his maker, that lead investigator and lover, gets kidnapped. And the last third of the book is him utilizing his new powers to help locate and rescue him. That leads us into the second book, which is called West of Nowhere. Hunter is developing a power that Kai, which is the name of the, the vampire lover slash lead investigator, has never seen before. How to describe it? Hunter has this ability to leech out a person's worst memories and recreate them basically as living virtual reality. He can drop the surroundings that we are in and replace them with someone's memories and force them to relive it, maybe heighten the trauma, heighten the physical pain that they were going through. West of Nowhere kind of explores that new power in which it actually turns out, and I'm spoiling my own book, but Hunter is actually part demon and he didn't know it. I had to look up, there's actually a phrase for that, cambion. He is a cambion. So he was part human, part demon to begin with, now he's also part vampire, and that's putting all these powers and abilities in a blender 
Kai and the Order are having to learn to adapt to this new person, this new type of creature. I titled it West of Nowhere because most of this investigation that we're going to follow in that book takes place in San Francisco, which is far out west. But if you've ever been in San Francisco, you know it's like another world. And the main case in this book is that San Francisco has a fairly large homeless population. And in the story, those people are going missing. The numbers of homeless people that are disappearing are enough that now people are actually taking notice. Finding out what's happening to these people goes into the body horror aspect of the second story. In the course of figuring out who and what is doing this body horror Thing to these people, we start to learn that they are being transported into an alternate dimension. And that leads us into Alternate Tracks, which is the third book, which will be out in February. This alternate dimension is almost a carbon copy of our world, but there are certain noticeable differences. Take, for example, Dallas. There is a distinctive skyline to Dallas. But in this world, it's blending other buildings like the capital of Austin. The capital building is in Dallas in this world. Again, trying not to spoilerize my own work is so difficult. Take the concept of identical twins. The mythos that I'm creating is that identical twins are not supposed to exist. Our twin is supposed to be in the alternate dimension. So we have carbon copy versions of our own selves, but they lead completely different lives in this alternate dimension. Hunter, his doppelganger lives in this alternate dimension and he is a rock star, but he also has the demonic gene or whatever in him. So it's interesting to see what he does as his demonic self in this other realm. Expansive world building. <laughs> well, that's good. I think that's that's necessary, especially when you're writing this series. What is the, the overall goal for the Bloodbound series itself? I have never had a bigger brainstorm than when I was first crafting this reboot. I have figured out the basic plots that I want to explore for the next four books in the series that I'm hoping I will have written by this time next year, including a rework of one of my original three. That one was called The Railroad Ripper, and it was set in the 1880s in Austin, Texas, exploring Kai's backstory. And I figured that I can do that, do maybe one or two side novels exploring Kai's backstory and get back into the main Bloodbound story. The first three kind of completed an arc and I imagine these next three will complete another arc. And that's the kind of format I think I can follow is three novels in an arc, Kai's backstory, three novels in an arc, Kai's backstory. Well, I think the creation of a trilogy itself is underutilized. That's wonderful to see, especially if you've gotten the brainstorm that, that you have. I can't wait to see what else you come up with. I'm just crossing fingers that I can make it through. Like I've got the titles, I've got the basic plot hooks. Now I just have to write the 220 some odd pages for each one. That's easy pickings, I'm sure. Only 220 pages, of course. Why, why oh not? You're looking to eventually get this into the comic format. How is that process going so far? I am going into the comic aspect of it completely blind. I don't have an artist's hand. I have an author's fingertips. That's how I like to describe it. So I'm trying to find independent artists and people who can help me, help guide me along the way. I found Joey Oliveira from Afterlight Comics on Fiverr, and he offers to adapt writing into the comic book script format. So I hired him to adapt a chapter of Reawakening for me. Now I have the base understanding of how to script a comic. Now I need to find artists and I'm commissioning artists every so often just to give me headshots of my characters for the website. And I am uh, speaking with an artist right now who has more experience in actually crafting web comics to give me a dummy cover or a concept cover for a comic book. I'm going along the theory that it would not go to print, but having that format of a comic book cover will help inform the style of the comic that I would eventually like to see. I would love to see it as a web comic. I think that's the easiest 
way to get this goal achieved. But now it's just a, a matter of finding the artist who enjoys the story and wants to come along for the journey. Who's the artist that you're commissioning? They go by Kai Starlight. Okay, the name of their their comic is U- Yukio. U-K-I-Y-O. Addressing the complex themes like abuse and body horror, and what is it about those themes that needed to be told and how did that help you as a writer and as a person? Writing the original series was kind of my way of dealing with the things I was going with at the time. Anyone who has gone through traumatic experiences, abuse, that kind of thing will tell you those memories don't really go away, even if you find a, an outlet. I had just come off of a period where, full disclosure, I was institutionalized for a week. It was more due to the work environment that I was in at the time, but it was also a buildup of other traumatic experiences, loss, growing depression. And I felt that with rebooting this series, I could probably put out the message I wanted about those topics better than I did 10 years ago. 10 years ago, I was just barely turning 30. I'm still a kid, mentally, still more of a a teenager. So really writing, creating this world, and especially writing the more trauma-inducing scenes was my way of just pushing all the negative thoughts and the recurring intrusive things that depression does to you out of my body and mind. If nothing else, having these books out in print and digitally is just my way of saying goodbye to the old me and embracing the newer, better, healthier me. You also have music and playlists that are attached to each book as well, too, which I think is a great concept. Let's talk about the music and playlist that accompanies each book here. You know, how did you curate them and what role does music play with each novel in shaping its atmosphere? Everyone has their their special playlist music that they go to when they feel a certain way. I have a rage playlist that's mostly disturbed. I started listening to um, Sirius XM Octane, which is mostly heavy metal, very, very heavy guitar based rock. And the more I listened to the lyrics of these songs that kept coming up in their playlist, the more I thought, huh, this this is kind of copacetic with the messages or they're more aligned with the characters, especially Hunter. So what I did one day, I was about three or four chapters into writing uh, Reawakening. And I thought, okay, if I start curating these songs, I might even have a better understanding of the plot moving forward. So I just started compiling and compiling and compiling. And then I thought, you know, this is getting me through my writing periods. I'm listening to them as I'm writing. I've got them going on YouTube in the background. Why not just share the playlist with everybody? And so ever since, as I'm writing each progressive book, I am curating a playlist, saving it to a YouTube playlist and Apple Music so that people can find me on those two because I don't I don't deal with Spotify. I have my issues with Spotify. Some of these bands don't have the audience I think they deserve. And I'm not claiming to be a best-selling writer. I'm not signed to a publishing house or anything. I'm just a local journalist wanting to tell a story. But these are bands that I admire. They are very poetic in their own way. Why not, you know, share the love with them. I'm sure none of them know who I am. None of them know what my books are. They certainly don't endorse the story, but you know, I'm a fan. Do with this playlist what you will. If you look at each book of your series so far, and you could only pick one song per book that highlights the epitome of that book, what is it for book one, book two, and book three? The first one And this has been the case since I wrote the original. Poets of the Fall, and I'm not sure if you know of them, gamers would know them, Alan Wake's in-house band Old Gods of Asgard. That's Poets of the Fall. They did a song way back when called Locking Up the Sun. And if you listen to that song, you will get the energy that I'm trying to put out in this whole story. But I think that's the quote-unquote theme song for reawakening, introducing you to the whole world. For West of Nowhere, that's the one that takes place primarily in 
uh, San Francisco. The group Gunship has a new album out and one of their big singles from that one is called Monster in Paradise. I think that thematically suits the story for that one. And then for alternate tracks, alternate tracks is actually pretty musically heavy since the alternate world hunter is a rock singer. His thing is he comes into our world, takes the music that's popular and transfers it over into the alternate world, passes it off as his own. Anything that I like from this world, he's going to turn it into a hit single in his world. And there is a song from the band Set It Off that I came across on Octane. Evil People is the name of that one. The lyrics to that pretty much sum up uh, the theme for book number three. Have you ever thought of actually approaching these bands and say, hey, your music was so awesome that I wrote a novel series with it? I have done it in the form of just tagging them ever so often in my posts, especially when I'm putting out the the playlists on Twitter and Blue Sky, the ones who are on Blue Sky, and I don't think any of them are. But on Twitter, I've certainly said, you know, check out my playlist that's inspired this story featuring Poets of the Fall, Beartooth, et cetera, et cetera. And I also add the disclaimer, they don't endorse it. They probably don't know me. I'm just a fan. I think one of, one of the bands actually liked it. I don't think they commented or retweeted. I'm sure I would remember if they did. But yeah, I take the, the coward's way of just saying, hey, did a thing. Check it out if you, if you want. No big deal. I don't think it's a coward thing. I think the fact that you're you're being inspired by these bands is a great aspect of inspiration and creativity. And the fact that you're tagging them isn't a coward's way. It's just, hey, you know, look look you're, at this stuff. You're totally right. And uh, that's my resolution for this year. I have to stop thinking negatively as I'm doing these things. You're completely 100% right. It is not a coward cowardly thing to do. It is the only way really to get these people to see what I'm doing and that, Hey, you're inspiring me to, to do this other creative thing. Yeah. Totally, totally get that and need to stop doing that. We do what we do for as long as we do, be it a journalist, be it an author, be it a podcast host, a show host, an interviewer. Um, You know, we have our own styles of, of how we do things and, you know, we want to be noticed in some way, shape or form, but you know, 8 billion people in the world doesn't always allow that. So we can only do so much and we scream into the void as we do. And if someone notices it all the better, if they don't, then someone will notice it. So we do what we can. (laughs) Absolutely. That's the mantra I've had to keep in my head. Every time I've put these books out, I did so knowing it's not going to be an instant success and success has to be measured by a certain degree of realism. And there have been weeks weeks that have gone by without anybody buying the book. They're on Kindle Unlimited, so uh, Prime subscribers can actually read them for free. The Amazon system will tell me, you know, how many pages people have read. And that can really, really get depressing if you check that every day and see, oh, someone read two pages and then stopped. That's fantastic. And by the same token, you know, I ran a free promotion for Reawakening this week. And on the first day, 24 people bought the book, um, got it for free. And that thrilled me, even though I wasn't making a dime off of it. 24 people is more than I get in six, eight months for a single title. And yet I continue to write. I continue to put these things out because I enjoy telling this story. And that's what I need to hang on to ultimately is I'm telling a story that I like if people take the chance to open it up so much the better. I've had a lot of authors on in the past. That's the one thing is the imposter syndrome that you get from creating this, whatever series it is, whether it's sci-fi, fantasy, bloodbound itself, when it comes to being a writer, that this is the only healthy way to really deal with it. The one thing I noticed on your website as well too, which is of course uh, in the lower third, but it's bloodboundnovels.com, is that you have an audiobook as well. Is the audiobook for every single novel or is it just for the first series? So far, it's just for the first one. Months before I started writing Reawakening, 
I had found a voice actor, a hobbyist voice actor. He goes by Gav VA on YouTube. And I found myself coming back to his channel again and again because I was enjoying the stories he was telling. He does ASMR type snippets where he's telling a five or 10 minute story as a certain character, original character. And then he has these ongoing serials. Like there's a sci-fi featured one. There is a body horror story called Mind Flayer that I really fell in love with. And listening to that, I was like, I wonder if he wouldn't mind narrating an audiobook version of Reawakening because I felt his voice and tone would really well suit my characters and my story. So I reached out to him and said, hey, do you think you want to take this on? He said, sure. Fast forward to this past week, he finished recording a six hour long version unabridged of Reawakening. We put it up on Audible. It's now available for sale. It is amazingly exciting for me to see this story adapted in another context, which is why I'm I'm so gung-ho about seeing it in comic form. Because reading it as a reader, just reading the text can only provide one certain mental picture. Hearing the story can put it in a completely different mind picture, mind Kodak. You know, obviously comic being a visual medium, each medium would bring in a new viewpoint to this story and maybe put it in a context that I hadn't even thought of when I originally wrote the thing. And that's what I find so exciting about this audiobook version. The way Gav will inflect certain phrases, certain words in a way that I didn't hear them myself when I was writing it thrills me to no end. And I asked him, you know, would you be interested in continuing on if we moved on and did uh, West of Nowhere? And his response to me, quote, hell yeah. I'm going to give him some time to rest, work on his own projects for a while, and then we're going to club together and look about recording the next one. I would imagine we would probably only do one of these a year, maybe two. So they'll be coming out at a much slower pace than the, I intend the books will. The audiobook thing thrills me to no end. I think that's interesting because that not a lot of people actually do the audiobook route. I don't know if it's due to cost. I don't know if it's due to finding the right voice for it. I've seen a lot of drama and, and radio plays that have been turned into podcasts. But I think an audiobook is perfect, especially for those that are just tired of the podcast scene, which is, I know, ironic saying on this type of show. But I think it's the fact that, you know, if you're on a long drive, you want to throw in a good audiobook. It's amazing how quickly time can pass when you are drawn into a good story, especially if it's being read to you and you don't have to do the do the work yourself of reading it. Yeah, I love I love reading stuff out loud to my husband. There's a website called 1900 Hot Dog is a fantastic comedy website created by two people who used to work for Cracked. Okay. And they will pillory bad books. There are books that are just crafted to be scams, like listicles in book form, and they will go after them with the heat of a thousand suns and it is so fun to read i read them out loud Uh, my husband tyler has come to the brink of wetting himself (laughs) with how funny their writing is so i highly recommend 1900 hot dog if you want to just let loose with laughter and make fun of really really bad writing i'm sure there's a whole slew of new seasons of that ai generated drivel that's been promoted and published. Yeah. And I think some of these may have been, although there is one guy in particular that they go after a lot. He has written the same book. It's dating advice. And he rewrote it only once, one for men, one for women. And then in the past 10 years, he's just given them different titles, changed maybe one or two words. And it's the exact same book again and again. And he gets rightfully roasted over the coals for it. Sounds like uh, professors re-releasing textbooks with slight changes as well, and you're still paying 200 bucks a book. They've gone after that as well. Okay, I, I, I'm definitely going to have to take a look at the site then. It sounds interesting for sure. Absolutely. That, that's got to be tough as a journalist when it comes to whether you're interviewing people or whether you're you're looking for a story itself. How do you deal with journalism and creative block? In journalism, it's especially hard because you are you are working on a set deadline. Our shows are on at 5.30 p.m. and 9 p.m. And 
you have to have something ready to go. I work mainly on the web side of things, which I think is easier for me. I've, I've worked as an on-air producer and as a web producer, and that ticking clock is my big enemy on the producing side of things. On web, it just seems to flow. I have not had that big of a problem coming up with an interesting headline or an opening paragraph that will keep people reading. And that's because there's no real set deadline. As long as I get it up on the web, people will find it. But with the the deadline of on-air producing, it's that big thing. If, if I don't have this in by deadline, we're going to have to fill. And that just gives me unending panic. That's why I stick to the website of things. For writing my books, since I don't have a set deadline, since I don't have to have a certain number of pages in by certain date, if I come across a block, I will just close my app and say, okay, you need to think on it. And however many days it takes for me to think on it. I was coming across to the third act of the third book. And I was not getting anywhere in terms of how to accelerate the plot. I didn't write a word for three weeks. And then just one night, I couldn't sleep. The thought occurred to me, okay, just wind up the main story here at the end of act two. And then the more I thought about it, the more I thought this is how True Blood operated in its early seasons. They would wind up the main story or the main mystery by the middle of the season finale. And then you still have 20 minutes where they're going to set stuff up for the next book. And I was like, okay, that's the route I probably need to take. After reorganizing my thoughts, came up with the idea of accelerating the third act of book three. There's a time jump. uh, There's a character death that accelerates the story a little bit. And now I have a good basis for what will eventually be book four. And I have a chapter and a half written of book four, which I'm going to hold on while I finish this adaptation of an older book. I like the fact that you have a plan already in place. I like the fact that you're being organized enough to get your series ahead of where you need to be. You already have plans for side stories. You already have plans for the next arc. And not a lot of authors can say that, to be honest. I'm not sure how other authors work. I don't think I've gone to look for advice from other authors because I know that their plans probably wouldn't work for me. It's a very instinctual thing for me. I know how I work with other things. How I work in in the newsroom is different from how other people work in the newsroom. So I just have to go with my gut and say, okay, this is how I'm going to work ahead. This thing's not working. Let me shift my focus to something else or just stop entirely give it some time to to boil in the back of my head and then something will will work out. Everyone usually asks, what's the wisest piece of advice or what's the most BS piece of advice that you've ever received? But what is the second wisest piece of advice that you've received that stuck with you in your career? My senior year of high school, I was actually doing dual credit with a local community college and I was taking college level English. And the professor suggested the concept of complete free writing. Now, people who who try to, to write as a career know free writing is just basically writing a paragraph, two paragraphs of just free form in the context of what you are writing. It's like pouring pancake batter out on a griddle and seeing what develops in the context of your story. But this professor suggested just doing essentially a brain dump. Every thought that is going through your head, write it on the page. And I thought, this seems stupid until I tried it. And all the intrusive or recurring thoughts that were going through my head came off on the page. And then after 15 minutes, they didn't come through anymore. I completely ridded them out of my head. I didn't suffer any writer's block. Any of the usual obstacles that I was going through in my writing were just gone. And so when I set about writing a chapter or something, I'll take 10 or 15 minutes and I will just transfer every thought running in my head, put it on an document and then delete the document. I found that that has really improved how much I can get done in a writing session with minimal revision. If ever you're wanting to write, I would suggest take 10 or 15 minutes and 
dump every thought onto the page, even if it has nothing to do with the story. And I think you'll be surprised with how much clearer your mind is. In looking at your work here, and this is something you could do, and this is just a suggestion, doesn't have to take fruition. Proof of concept is something that is usually used when it comes to the creation of, of a series. Would you ever think of making your series film format? Would you ever think of doing that? Absolutely. Um, as a matter of fact, my lofty goals, my imagination will sometimes travel to the world of, you know, <laughs> can't believe I'm going to admit this, but there are times when I pretend I'm on Entertainment Tonight talking about how surprised and pleased I am that this project, this book, became the newest hit for FX, or that I'm hosting Saturday Night Live <laughs> uh, just off the basis of success of this book. It's fun. It's silly to think of, but in the back of my head, there's always that thought, you know, this would also work well as a TV show or maybe a film series. I think more of a TV show, really, since it's more episodic to go in line with these books. I'm up for any any idea that would help expand this world into new medium. Well, I think what you need to do is put this book into a episodic series script format and maybe down the road start pitching it. And I think they would be amazing. It's it's going to be the new True Blood. Just saying. Like, With less look. boobs. I mean, yeah, it's, it is what it is. I'm sure it'll look. You're you're reaching a, a wonderful audience in itself. There's going to be a lot of areas that want to produce it. So by all means, please feel free to to reach out to those studios whenever you get that made. And uh, I'll be watching it. I'll be flipping through the TV or watching it on the next streaming service, whatever that is. And and oh look, I remember that author. That's awesome. From from the, the mind that created yes. Bloodborne. There you go. What was an early experience where you learned that language had power? <laughs> Third grade. Um, yes, it was the first time I ever got detention because I had watched Married with Children the night before. And I can even tell you the scene. I, I don't remember what led up to it, but it was Al... Bundy brushing imaginary ants off his arm saying off get off me you bastards <laughs> and I repeated that in class I didn't understand why there was a collective gasp in the room and I was still confused when I had my little conduct card punched three punches meant you went to detention and the teachers went punch 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 and it had to be explained to me by my grandmother later, which in retrospect was even more embarrassing because I used the word bastards in front of my grandmother. Uh, but that was my lesson that words have meaning. Um, and it's best that you understand what those words mean before you use them. How did that translate into being a journalist and also being a creative writer? It taught me as far as journalism to uh, have a second set of eyes, make sure that what you write means the same thing to this person as it does to you. There have been times where I've written something that I thought was pretty clever, maybe even a little funny, and it was met with, what does this mean? Or are you sure you want to say it that way? And uh, yeah, it's that is a constant uh, thing when you are writing, especially for journalism, is you, you need to mean what you say and say what you mean. Otherwise, it can get convoluted and cause... Uh, disruption and issues that you don't want to have to deal with after. Same thing with writing these books. I make sure that I have a second set of eyes. Usually that's my husband. Sometimes that's someone who knows what I'm doing. And I ask them to take this little portion. Does this sound the way I think it sounds? And they'll say, yeah, I think you're on the right track. Or mm, that's a little confusing. I want to add a bit more detail. So having that advisory aspect also helps. At what point are we good enough? Uh, that is the question that's dogged me uh, most of my life. I don't think that's a quantifiable question other than, you know, as long as you've got life and breath in your body, 
as long as you have a roof over your head, as long as you're making enough money to get by, you're okay. You're good. And I think a lot of us, myself included, have had to stop that voice in the back of our head saying, this is not where you need to be. You need to be at a much higher station in life. Aspirations are fine. Working towards them in a sensible way is fine. But my main problem has been not despairing that I'm not at that point yet. Realizing that having goals is fine, but it takes time to reach them. Everyone has one person that inspired them on their path to where they are today. Who was that for you? That has definitely been my husband, especially in the last couple of years. When we were living down in Florida, he was diagnosed with testicular cancer. He is totally cancer-free now, but getting him through the chemo and the surgeries and all that was something to witness. And he cried there, there was a lot of tears on both sides, but he never once said, I don't want to go to chemo, even though I know he was thinking that. And the strength that he showed in the face of, you know, the big C is why I call him my warrior. And that's actually this painting that I had commissioned for him to celebrating him completing his chemo. That is a piece called My Warrior. That is, that is supposed to be him in the armor fighting this big giant dragon type creature, the cancer, and him succeeding in his quest. I think for that alone, he's an inspiration to me, but you know, his devotion and dedication to me with all my depression, depressive thoughts and, and what have you has been inspirational to me. And I I can't say enough about how having just that one person in your life, even if you're not married to them, even if it was just a best friend, having that confidant, that sounding board just as wonders for you as a creator and just you as a human. Very inspiring. I'm, I'm glad that he is cancer free. I'm glad that you are uh, together for as long as you have been and that you're, you have a sounding board. I think a lot of people can't say that either. I mean, we stay so much in here that we don't have that ability to communicate clearly or properly when it comes to situations in our lives. So mm-hmm. uh, that's wonderful to see. From a professional standpoint, you are a journalist. You are also a successful author, not only with your novel series, but now with an audiobook, with a potential comic book, maybe even a TV film series in the future. Who knows? Which means you'll have to come back on and talk about that as well. Absolutely. I'd love to have you back on. Uh, whatever success comes your way. So professionally or successful in that regard. Do you consider yourself personally successful? That is another question I've wrestled with a lot, especially in my lower points. That was the intrusive thought. You're not a success. You are not a happy person. Therefore, you are not successful. You're not successful. Therefore, you are not a happy person. Um, Enough of that BS has calmed down for me. I have a stable job. It pays enough to where I can take care of rent and utilities and there's still enough to, you know, buy food. And I'm embracing a hobby that I've done since I was in grade school. I have written things. I've written my own little books just for my own personal benefit since I was in fourth grade. Um, But now I'm putting them out where people can read them, interact with them. Yeah, I would say even though I'm not selling much. I'm not making anything that would, you know, take me out of journalism. I'm sharing stories and that is enough for me. I had to get myself out of the headspace where I have to make money off of this. I have to have financial proof of this being a success. The fact that I can reach out and touch the physical copies of my book really does put enough joy in me to say, I'm doing great. Let's keep going. And they look beautiful. Thank you. Um, I will confess these are Adobe stock. I made sure to uncheck the thing that says AI is allowed. I'm fine with stock footage when it comes to book covers and stuff. When we're talking into comic books and things, I absolutely have to have a real artist working on them 
I will pay them what they think they're worth, probably more. I do embrace the concept of tipping for work. So as far as this comic book concept goes, I'm all for finding the indie artist that wants to work with me. And I promise you, you will be compensated what you think you were worth. A lot of comic people that watch and listen to this will be happy to hear that. So that's, that's great to see. The reverse of success is failure. How do you deal with your failures? Not well, I'll tell you. I got fired from a, a journalism role back in 2016, and that sent me into a huge depression spiral, especially in journalism where you have to be letter and word perfect. Losing your job feels about as bad as you know misspelling a word in a headline <clears throat> for whatever reason. Anything I count as a failure will worm its way into my head. It will be a constant battle of just pushing those negative thoughts out of my head and just say, hey, here's the facts. You went wrong here. You know how to correct that and prevent it from happening in the future. And it's just a matter of learning from that mistake and moving on. The younger generation is looking at your work and they're becoming inspired to be creative in their own way, whether it's as a writer, journalist, or creative in some way, shape, or form, you've inspired them down that path. How can they inspire the generation that follows them? It's like Dr. Green said on ER on that episode where he died. <laughs> you need to be generous with your time and you need to be generous with your, your whole self. And I think that is something that's being missed out on a lot in this day and age. Um, lift people up when you can, um, even if it's just hitting a retweet button or a repost button that can go a long way to helping another person feel seen and heard. If people ask you for advice, give it to them without being critical, you know, saying I wouldn't do that or you should do this, I would say. Have you thought about taking it this way? Have you thought about taking out this, this, and this? There just needs to be more kindness in general. And I think it's such a simple thing that few people are doing right now. And just, just do it. If your life was a comic book or a novel, what would its title be? And what would its soundtrack be? I actually tried writing an autobiographical uh, series for Kindle Vela, which I stopped on because I'm, I, do, I don't want to go through some of these stories over again, but I think it would be called My Life as a Series of Mistakes because the mistakes I made have brought me to the point where I am now. I, th I think it's embracing those mistakes and like I said earlier, moving on from them. My Life as a Series of Mistakes. That would be the title. Soundtrack would probably be more pop kind of thing, Kelly Clarkson type stuff, because that was what I was listening to a lot in the day. Maybe even some Disturbed going in there for, for the rage uh, issues. Anything that's in my iTunes library would, would make a good addition to that soundtrack. Wonderful. Well, Chase, I do hate to say it, but that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. I want to thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you so much for having me. I was glad that I took the chance and reached out and said, hey, would you mind if I talked about this? I am. I'm always happy to have any independent or professional person that comes on the show. And taking that first step is always difficult. I'm glad you did. And I'm glad that this is one of the shows that you will appear on. And I'm sure I'll see you on Entertainment Tonight in the near future, definitely. Thank you so much. Cross and fingers. Before I let you go, where can we find you? How can we support you? Of course, where is this amazing series and anything else you'd like to promote? All right. The easiest way to learn about the books is bloodboundnovels.com. You can also find me on Blue Sky and the other place at by Chase McPee. The books are available on Amazon. The audiobook is available on Audible, Amazon, and iTunes. Certain other websites across the country and the world. I know Waterstones and Foils in the UK have the first one, not sure about the second one, but the easiest way to buy, read, listen, bloodboundnovels.com. You can, of course, find this interview 
and a thousand plus others on our website, tgtmedia.com or twogeekstalking.com. That's T-W-O. Of course, the website's going through a revamp. So go to our YouTube channel, which is a lot more updated than our website, which is youtube.com forward slash tgtmedia. The podcast is back. You can find it wherever you stream your podcasts on by searching Two Geeks Talking or find it at twogeekstalking.podbean.com. And as I say every week, everyone has a story to tell. It's up to me to help bring that out. Thanks for listening and watching on Two Geeks Talking.